So, our next speaker, I'm just going to give you a, a short introduction. Ustaz Bassam Zawadi has been active in the area of comparative religion and defending Islam for the past 11 years. Working clo closely with his fellow peers, Ustaz Bassam has authored several articles and conduct, conducts debates and workshops around the world in the service of defending Islam from attacks of critics. One may find uh, Ustaz Bassam's work at calltomonotheism.com. Ustaz Bassam takes a very great care in ensuring he does not sugarcoat or water down Islam for the sake of appeasing critics. He painstakingly puts the effort to conduct rigorous research in order to provide sound and intellectual response uh, to critics from an orthodox perspective. This is key, orthodox perspective. This passion of Ustaz Bassam has also led him to actively research and refute arguments of modernists and progressive Muslims who shy away from defending the traditional stances of Islam. Ustaz Bassam will be sharing some of his expertise and knowledge in the area with all of us today, inshallah. Uh, Ustaz Bassam currently lives and works in the Middle East. However, as a Canadian himself, he frequently visits Canada from time to time. We are happy to, uh, to have Ustaz Bassam with us, inshallah, and to share his knowledge with us. And inshallah, his, his segment will be a little bit, uh, will be also slightly interactive as well, too. Uh, without further ado, Ustaz Bassam, please. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, uh, first I would like to extend a big thanks to the I3 Institute for inviting me to come and speak. And I want to thank all you brothers and sisters for coming here today and participating in what you'd find to be a very important discussion. It's extremely saddening that there are extremists today who, in the name of Islam, shed innocent blood and do so in order to further their own personal, personal goals and agendas. But what is equally saddening and disturbing is the extremism that we find on the opposite side of the spectrum. That extremism that some of you may know as progressive Islam or liberal Islam or modernist Islam. And I'm not speaking about the modern Islam that seeks to address the problems of the 21st century for Muslims while abiding by the constant principles of Islam, but rather that modernist Islam that seeks to water down the faith to an extent that is no longer recognizable. They seek to take the hijab and make it a cultural symbol rather than a religious one. They take the hudud and argue that it only belongs to the seventh century and it's no longer applicable for our times today, and so on and so forth. This movement has crossed so many red lines. They've even gone way beyond any red line, and they've gone to the extent of watering down and compromising the very heart of the message of Islam, the shahada itself. And it is that problem that we're going to be grappling with today, inshallah. Some questions that we're going to be exploring together today are... Sorry, I didn't know the projector was going to be like this, so it might appear a bit small, but I'm going to be reading out everything. First of all, is pluralism unconditionally bad or good? What is Islam's stance regarding other religions? Could religions other than Islam provide a path of salvation, that is, a path to paradise? Who is the kafir? What is the definition of a kafir? Is he only the one who knows the truth of Islam and rejects it, or is there a broader definition for this word? Who can we label as a kafir? Can we comment about the eternal fate of the kafir? Is the punishment endured in hell temporary or everlasting? What about the Ahlul Fatra that we hear about so much? What is this doctrine of the Ahlul Fatra? What did, the, what did the different theological schools of Islam say about the Ahlul Fatra and what their faith is? Are there passages in the Qur'an and the Ahadith which appear to suggest that other religions are acceptable in the eyes of Allah? Passages which religious pluralists appeal to? Or are there responses to these passages that they appeal to? 
is the Islamic view of salvific exclusivism, that is, that only Islam is the true path to God, riddled with logical and moral difficulties? Are there rational objections to this belief? You believe that Islam is the only true religion and all the religions are false. Are there rational objections to this belief? And if there are, are there good responses to them? So we have a lot to cover today and we'll just get straight to it. First, we'll begin with pluralism. What is pluralism? What do you think about when you hear the word pluralism? Do you think about legal pluralism? We all know that Islamic societies in the past, Islamic caliphates in the past, allowed Christians and Jews to set up their own civil courts to deal with their own civil issues. So is that what we're talking about? Is that what we're thinking about? Or are we thinking about political pluralism? where you have a state which tolerates several political parties operating within it? Or are you thinking about cultural pluralism, also known as multiculturalism, something us Canadians proudly embrace and something which Islam proudly embraces as well? Or are we talking about religious pluralism? And when we say the term religious pluralism as well, what do we mean by it? Do we mean a state that accepts or tolerates or embraces its citizens practicing different religions? If so, Islam is open to this. But that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about a specific kind of pluralism. But the reason why I bring this up is because if anyone ever comes and asks you, is Islam pluralistic? I don't want any of us to jump the gun and say yes or no right away. We need to clarify our terms very carefully here and we have to clarify what the other person means when he uses the term pluralism. Because Islam is pluralistic in one sense and it may not be in another. But what we're going to be talking about today is soteriological pluralism or salvific religious pluralism or also known as universalism or some of you may know as perennialism. Different terms that are used for this notion. And it's defined in terms of salvation. So according to an equality soteriological pluralism, a plurality of religions are equally effective in guiding people to salvation. And this notion usually comes in two different forms. The first form is reductive pluralism. So it states that all major religious traditions share a common element which makes them successful in attaining or providing a path of, for salvation. So there is a common element in Christianity, in Judaism, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Islam, etc. that makes each of those religions sufficient enough for granting its adherents salvation. The second form is non-reductive pluralism which states that all major traditions have distinctive features unique to them through which God may guide people even if there was no common essence to them. Okay, thanks. So Islam with its unique features, Christianity with its unique features, Judaism with its unique features, are all sufficient in the eyes of God for attaining salvation. John Hick was a, a, a prominent British theologian and philosopher of religion. And he was a very devout Catholic. And when he was living in the UK, his homeland, he made many friends from, from the subcontinent, especially Muslims. And what he came to realize was a lot of my Muslim friends from the subcontinent are actually very good, nice people. How can I believe that they're going to hell just because they didn't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? And so he became a religious pluralist and he became one of its most ardent defenders in the 20th and early 21st century. He passed away in 2010. So he gives the following illustration in order to explain the notion of religious pluralism better. This is an illustration. An elephant was brought to a group of blind men who had never encountered such an animal before. One felt a leg and reported that an elephant is a great living pillar. Another felt the trunk 
and reported that an elephant is a great snake. Another felt a tusk and reported that an elephant is like a sharp plowshare, and so on. And then they all quarreled together, each claiming that his own account was the truth, and therefore all others false. In fact, of course, they were all true, but each referring only to one aspect of the total reality and all expressed in very imperfect analogies. So Islam is partially true. Christianity is partially true. Hinduism is partially true. No single religion has acquired a view of the total reality, but each religion has partial truth to it. That's what he's trying to communicate through this illustration. Giving a very brief history of religious pluralism. Religious pluralism is not a modern phenomenon. It's not a modern notion. It actually goes all the way back to the Roman Empire. Before the Christianization of the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire was a very polytheistic society. They worshipped a multiple host of gods. And they were quite tolerant of one another. No one insisted uh, that the other w worship his god. So if one worshipped the pagan god Jupiter, he didn't have any objection if the other person worshipped the pagan god Isis. No reference to Dash. Uh, if someone worshipped the pagan god Mithra, he didn't have an objection if someone worshipped the pagan god Sibyl. So that's why when Christianity came on the scene later on, they didn't really like Christianity. Because Christianity teaches salvific exclusivism. You cannot make, make it to paradise except if you believe that Jesus Christ was your Lord and Savior and shed his blood for you on the cross. But moving on, to the 15th to the 18th century. Now, the Roman Empire is fully Christianized. World exploration expeditions started taking place. The likes of Christopher Columbus, Marco Polo, maybe a century, a century earlier, and so on and so forth, started exploring the world. They started exploring new lands, new peoples, new tribes. And what started to happen was they started discovering that Christianity is far from being a universal religion. There are many people in the world who never heard of Jesus Christ. And two things began to dawn upon them. One, it's harsh and cruel for us to condemn people to hell just because they never heard of Jesus Christ. Secondly, they began to think that religion is something that is relative. So as they've discovered all these new lands and peoples having their own different religions, this notion of religious pluralism started slowly but surely creeping into Christian circles. And it didn't help that at the time there were enlightened, enlightened rationalists who were mocking Christians who believed in this doctrine that all non-Christians would go to hell. Now at the time, today China has a population of 1.3 billion at the time, there was a pop the Chinese were around 16 million. So some people would come and mock the Christians and say, are you going to say that the 16 million Chinese men are going to go to hell just because they didn't believe in Jesus Christ? And so we see that it is during this era that religious pluralism started creeping in to Christian circles. And when we start to come to the 1930s, around a decade after the abolishment of the caliphate, we see that religious pluralism has unfortunately begun creeping into Islamic circles. Now, some academics argue that there are some major Sufi scholars in the past, such as Ibn Arabi, uh, Rumi, who adopted religious pluralism as a notion. But even if we assume that's the case, we don't see any trend emerging from that time. Rather, the trend that we're observing is in the 19, uh, has begun in the 1930s. And uh, an, an individual by the name of uh, Frithjof Shuan, also known as uh, Isa Nuruddin Ahmad, was a convert to Islam, and he was born in Switzerland, and he was heavily influenced by Hindu philosophy. And he began publicly preaching this notion of religious pluralism and started arguing that it is compatible with Islam. 
And then over time, you have notable converts to Islam, such as Guy Eaton, Martin Lings, uh, some other uh, religious pluralists who are not converts, uh, Sayyid Hussein Nasr, who is the editor of the famous or the infamous, depends how you view it, the, st the study Quran that was published last year, also hold these kinds of views. You also have Fazlur Rahman, who, was, who studied in Dioband and became a Muslim scholar, but then he went to the West and did his, furthered his studies there, and he adopted this notion of religious pluralism. Now, just because I mention all their names together, that doesn't necessarily mean that they all held identical beliefs in religious pluralism, but they all became religious pluralists eventually. And so we're seeing this trend continuing on till today. What's Islam's stance on religious pluralism? Let's read some Quranic passages together and some ahadith together. Surah 2, ayah 120. So, uh, ironically, it's what uh, Sheikh Osta ended his uh, lecture with. And never will the Jews or the Christians approve of you until you follow their religion. Say, indeed, the guidance of Allah is the only guidance. If you were to follow their desires after what has come to you of knowledge, you would have against Allah no protector nor helper. So here we see a clear distinction being made between the religion of the Jews and the Christians and guidance. So that entails that their religion is misguidance and obviously Islam rejects misguidance. Surah 2, Ayah 135 to 137. They say, be Jews or Christians, you will be guided. Say, rather, we follow the religion of Ibrahim السلام, inclining toward truth, and he was not of the polytheists. So here we are to shun or reject the call of the Christians of the, and Jews to follow their religion because it is not truth. Continuing on, say, O believers, we have believed in Allah and what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and the descendants and what was given to Musa and Isa and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and we are Muslims. So if they believe in the same as you believe in, then they have been guided. But if they turn away, they are only in dissension. So it is absolutely clear that in order for them to be guided, they need to believe in what we believe in. And what we believe in is in making no distinction between the prophets and the messengers. By the Christians rejecting the Prophet of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Jews rejecting the Prophet of Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Isa alayhi salam, and people from other faiths not accepting the Prophet of Muhammad, peace be upon him, this verse is clearly telling us that they are differentiating between the prophets and the messengers, hence they are not guided. Surah 3, Ayah 31. Saying Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, if you should love Allah, then follow me. So Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. If you want Allah's forgiveness, if you want to be overshadowed with Allah's mercy, you need to love and follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Something that people from other religions are not doing. Surah 4, Ayah 150. Indeed, those who disbelieve in Allah and His messengers and wish to discriminate between Allah and His messengers and say, we believe in some and disbelieve in others and wish to adopt a way in between. Well, this way in between is not good enough. Differentiating between the prophets and messengers still falls short of the standard that Islam has set for salvation. Surah 5, Ayah 72 to 73. They have certainly disbelieved who say, Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary. While the Messiah has said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Indeed, he who associates others with Allah, Allah has forbidden him paradise, and his refuge is the fire, and there are not for the wrongdoers any helpers. They have certainly disbelieved who say, Allah is the third of three, a reference to the Trinity, and there is no God except one God. 
And if they do not desist from what they are saying, they will, they will surely afflict the disbelievers, among them a painful punishment. So this is a very clear condemnation of the beliefs of the Christians. And the verse is very clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbid for them paradise due to their beliefs. Surah 7, Ayah 79, uh, Surah 7, Ayah 59. We had certainly sent Nuh salam to his people. And he said, O my people, worship Allah. You have no deity other than him. Indeed, I fear for you the punishment of a tremendous day. And these sorts of passages are just filling the pages of the Quran. You just go read the story of any of the prophets and messengers in the past. You would see that this is the same message all the time to their people. Worship Allah. It's not saying be a good person, feed the poor, smile, help the old lady cross the street. All of that is good and dandy. But at the same time, they're calling for tawheed. They're calling for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is clearly not in line with religious pluralism. Surah 7, ayah 157 to 158. Those who follow the messenger the unlettered prophet, whom they find written in what they have of the Torah and the Injil, who enjoins upon them what is right and forbids them what is wrong, and makes lawful for them the good things and prohibits for them the evil, and relieves them of their burden and the shackles which were upon them. So they who have believed in him, honored him, supported him, and followed the light which was sent down with him, the Qur'an, it is those who will be the successful. You want to attain success, you need to follow the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was prophesied in the Torah, in the Injil. And you need to support him and you need to honor him. Say, O Muhammad, sallam, O mankind, indeed I am the messenger of Allah to you all, to whom belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. There is no deity except him. He gives life and causes death. So believe in Allah and his messenger, the unlettered prophet, who believes in Allah and his words, and follow him that you may be guided. You want to be guided? It's not just being a good person. It's not picking any religion and then following it from the bottom of your heart. No, you need to follow and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. Surah 9, Ayah 31. They have taken their rabbis and priests, referring to the Jews and Christians, as lords besides Allah, and also the Messiah, son of Mary. And they were not commanded except to worship one God. There is no deity except him. Exalted is he above whatever they associate with him. Now here, when, when the verse says, when the ayah says that the Jews and Christians took their rabbis and priests as lords, it doesn't mean it in a literal sense that they actually call their rabbis and their priests God or Lord. Rather, they have assigned to them the right to legislate rulings. And they believe that they have done so with the permission of Allah. However, this is a false ascription. So this is their shirk when it comes to their rabbis and their priests. Another thing, notice at the end of the verse, it accuses the Jews and the Christians with this belief of theirs of having committing of having committed shirk. Now unfortunately there in modern times there are people who are, some people who are trying to come and say that the Jews and Christians are not mushrikeen and that they are just kuffar. They don't commit shirk because the Quran continuously distinguishes them from the mushrikun because they are called Ahlul Kitab. However, the, when the Quran does refers to them as Ahlul Kitab, it is doing so in order to differentiate them from the pagan idolaters who are intentionally worshipping a multiple host of gods. That doesn't mean that the Jews and Christians, however, are free from committing shirk. At the end of the day, we all know that Christians worship Jesus and that they worship Isa alayhi salam and Isa alayhi salam is not God, so this is obviously shirk. So the Christians and the Jews are mushrikun even though this is not the label assigned to them in the Qur'an in order to differentiate them from the pagans. Surah 9, Ayah 33. It is he who has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to manifest it over all religions, 
although the polytheists dislike it. I think this is one of the most anti-religious, pluralistic verses in the Qur'an. Those who are coming and saying all religions are equal, as long as you're a good person, you're going to make it to salvation, all religions provide an equal opportunity to attain paradise, this verse just smacks that notion straight in the face. Because the, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us is that Islam has come to manifest itself over all other religions, to be superior to all other religions, not to be on par or to be equal with other religions. And notice what the ending of the verse says, وَلَوْ كَرِهَ mushrikun." Although the polytheists dislike it, this should, be, this, should, this should serve as a self-reflection for many of these misguided brothers who ascribe themselves to this movement. Because it appears to me, even though it's not my place to come and uh, discuss what the in inner intentions of every single individual uh, is, but it seems pretty obvious that because the Muslim Ummah is in a state of weakness today, and the West is, is in dominance, that somehow we feel pressured to conform to that which is popular, to conform to that which is politically correct. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, the only thing you need to be concerned about is what I think. Do you care about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks? Do you care about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes and dislikes? Or is it what the West likes or dislikes? Now, I'm not trying to necessarily create this divide between the two. Obviously, there is a lot in common. But at the end of the day, when there are differences, we need to know where our loyalty lies. And at the same time, this doesn't mean that we preach Islam bluntly and harshly and say, well, we don't care if the polytheists dislike what we're saying. No, we have to preach with wisdom and good conduct. But at the end of the day, you need to be, you need to be blunt and not compromise on your faith. Surah 16, Ayah 36. I'm just going to read one part of it. Worship Allah and avoid taghut. Taghut refers to false deities, false gods, false objects of worship. So that means that there is such a thing as false gods, false religions, false objects of worship. And it's not something to embrace, but rather something to avoid. Stepping into the hadith literature now. First hadith, no child is born but on the fitrah. But its parents turn it into a Jew or a Christian. I think this is self-explanatory. Second hadith. An important hadith. Aisha radiallahu anha reported, I said, Messenger of Allah, وسلم, the son of Jud'an, Ibn Jud'an, the son of Jud'an, during the days of Jahiliyyah, established ties of relationship and fed the poor. Would that be of any avail to him? He said, It would be of no avail to him as he did not ever say, O oh my Lord, pardon my sins on the day of resurrection. So this whole notion of just be good to your fellow man and do good deeds and this whole undermining of faith is something which is flatly rejected in this hadith. This Ibn Jud'an sounds like a, what we would call today a very up, upright guy, a very decent guy. He was good to his family. He fed the poor. But that wasn't enough for him to attain salvation. Narrated Anas radiallahu anhu. A young Jewish boy used to serve the Prophet sallallahu and he became sick. So the Prophet sallallahu went to visit him. He sat near his head and asked him to embrace Islam. The boy looked at his father who was sitting there. The latter told him to obey Abu al-Qasim. Abu al-Qasim is the Prophet sallallahu And the boy embraced Islam. The Prophet ﷺ came out saying, Praise be to Allah who saved the boy from the hellfire. So clearly it is the Judaism, the Judaic beliefs of the boy that was going to land him in hellfire. Again, something that is not in line with religious pluralism. This hadith 
I personally find to be very powerful. The Prophet Sallallahu said, I swear, I swear that if Musa alayhi salam were alive and you followed him and left me, you would be misguided. If Musa were alive, he would have followed me. So here, the Prophet Sallallahu is not saying if you follow a false prophet, you'd be misguided. If you follow a liar or a corrupt person, instead of me, you're a false liar. No, even if the great and the magnificent prophet Musa alayhi salam, who is honored in the sight of Allah, who is one of the greatest of the prophets, were alive today and we followed him and we followed Musa alayhi salam, but not the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, we would still be misguided. So then what do we say about following all the false prophets and false religions of today? By the one in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad, there is no one among this ummah, Jew or Christian, who hears of me, then dies without believing in that with which I have been sent, but he will be one of the people of hellfire. I will elaborate a little bit more on this hadith later on in the discussion, but it seems pretty clear. So, right now we just read 10 Quranic passages together, and we looked at five Sahih Ahadith, and we could see that Islam is explicitly clear in its rejection of religious pluralism. These passages are very clear. It was my intention to just not really elaborate too much on them. I just wanted to come here and actually read them out for you and not come up with any fancy interpretation from my own. Now, we step into the area of kafir, a word that many Muslims these days are not feeling comfortable using. They don't, a lot of them don't like to use the word kafir. Uh, a lot of them prefer using the term non-Muslim. And what I've observed is that in recent times, the definition of the word kafir has been tainted partially. And it has been restricted in a manner that it shouldn't be restricted. So who is a kafir? Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah 64, Ayah 2, it is he who created you, and among you is the disbeliever, and among you is the believer. And Allah of what you do is all seeing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has categorized his creation into two different categories. You have the believer, and you have the non-believer. We don't see any terminology for something in between. So it would be fair then to say that a kafir is the one who is not a believer. Anyone who is not a believer, and we already read the passages together, which stipulate what you must do to be a believer. So whoever is not a believer, in other words, whoever is not a Muslim, is a kafir. So every non-Muslim is a kafir. Now, a lot of people these days don't like that. They don't like... They don't like the, the notion or the idea that every non-Muslim is a kafir. And they give two arguments in support of this. Let's look at them. Argument number one. You don't know which non-Muslim truly received the message of Islam and rejected it and whether he's going to help. So how... You don't know if that person, you know, and let's talk about you know, people in North Korea, the most state-controlled country in the world. They probably, probably most of them don't. In my opinion, I think that they qualify to be Ahlul Fatra of our times because I don't think they get the message of Islam there. But let's talk about people in North Korea, for example. Are they kuffar? Maybe they didn't receive the message of Islam, study it, analyze it, and then reject it. So is it fair to call them kuffar? Well, first of all, we already read the passage which distinguishes between the Muslim and the kafir, and there's no other third category. But I also want to 
respond to this argument directly by saying that, first of all, there's a double standard going on. Let me read this hadith out first, and then I'll explain what the double standard is. This hadith is reported in Bukhari and Muslim by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, By the one other than whom there is no deity, verily one of you performs the actions of the people of paradise until there is but an arm's length between him and it, and that which has been written overtakes him. And so he acts with the actions of the people of hellfire and thus enters it. And verily, one of you performs the actions of the people of hellfire until there is but an arm's length between him and it. And that which has been written overtakes him. And so he acts with the actions of the people of paradise and thus he enters it. So what's this hadith saying? This hadith is saying, excuse me, that you might see someone in this life who appears to be a pious Muslim who does good all his life and at the end, right before he passes away, he could leave Islam, you know, God protects us from that, you might fall out of Islam and end up going into hell. Likewise with the non-Muslim, which is what the argument is saying. You don't know if that non-Muslim would have accepted Islam if he got the message or whether he will eventually be saved. But then think about the double standard here. If you want to argue that you don't want to call every non-Muslim a kafir because you don't know if he received the true message of Islam and so you should just plead ignorance, well then, we shouldn't be calling each other Muslims here. For all we know, one of us could be a munafiq. One of us could be a spy working for the you know, intelligence agency or whatever. By the way, I'm innocent if you're here. <laughs> Eventually, he might apostatize in the future and enter hell. So be consistent in your methodology. Don't, you, know, you can't cherry pick what you want to do. If you don't want to call every non-Muslim a kafir because you don't know whether he accepted, uh, saw the message of Islam and rejected it, then also don't call every Muslim a Muslim because you don't know if he's a munafiq or a spy or whatever. Secondly, it is our job in this life to just judge by the apparent. We're not talking about the eternal fate of anyone here. There are ahkam, there are rulings specified for kuffar. I want to know, can I marry my daughter to this, to this person? What about the inheritance laws? Can this person enter Masjid al-Haram? And so on and so forth. We have ahkam, we have rulings specified for kuffar. You can't take those rulings should we bury him in a Muslim graveyard or in a Kafir graveyard? You can't take these rulings specified for kuffar and apply them on people you refuse to call kuffar. Be consistent. Thirdly, and we're going to talk about Ahlul Fatra after the break, but the Ahlul Fatra, what I've noticed is that there are people who are inconsistent in the theological view that they've adopted here by not labeling every non-Muslim a kafir and the position that they then hold when it comes to the Ahlul Fatra. Because as you're going to see later on, there are three dominant opinions about who the Ahlul Fatra are. Two out of those three dominant opinions still label the Ahlul Fatra as kuffar. And the third opinion, which says that the Ahlul Fatra are saved, are not kuffar, will still say that in this life, you still have to judge by the apparent and say that they are kuffar. So the thing is, brothers and sisters, is that when you adopt a certain view, you have to make sure that, first of all, you have actual proper scholarship as precedence for that view that you're holding, but also make sure that, you're, that that view that you're holding is not interlinked with another topic in which you hold a view which contradicts the view that you've held here. Everything has to be consistently aligned. This is why many scholars have advised laymen, be careful about mixing between madhabs. Because if you mix between madhabs in your fiqh recklessly, then you're going to end up being very inconsistent in the views that you hold. There is a foundation, there is a proper usul behind every ruling that comes out, whether it's fiqh or even in aqidah. So this, will, this point will become clear, but the point I wanted to make here is that those who are arguing that you cannot label every non-Muslim a kafir, 
are bound to be inconsistent when it comes to their views on Ahlul Fatra. Because the three dominant views on Ahlul Fatra do not line up with this view of not labeling every non-Muslim a kafir. Second argument they give is that a kafir is only one who knows that Islam is the truth and rejects it. Now, this definition is a modern one. It is based on a selective and partial reading of the Qur'an. Yes, there are passages in the Qur'an which speak about kuffar who recognized the truth of Islam and still rejected it. Who recognized the prophethood, the truth of the prophethood of Muhammad peace be upon him and still rejected the prophet. But that doesn't mean that these are the only type of kuffar or that this is the only descri description fit for kuffar. Now, what I may say right now might be a little difficult to digest for some. If, if it's not for some here, maybe some who are we're going to watch this lecture later on. But I ask that you pull, with, pull through with me until the very end. And inshallah, when we look at the whole subject comprehensively together, inshallah, everything will make sense to you. Now, what I want to argue here is that a kafir is not only one who rejects Islam after knowing it's true. And once again, I want to read passages from the Qur'an together. Now first I want to point out that the previous responses that I gave still apply. At the end of the day, you still need to judge by the apparent for legal purposes. And secondly, let's read these verses from the Qur'an together. Surah 2, Ayah 13. And when it is said to them, Believe as the people have believed. They say, Should we believe as the foolish have believed? Unquestionably, it is they who are the foolish, but they know it not. And here, Ibn Kathir, in his commentary, says that they are so ignorant that they don't even know they are the ones who are misguided. Surah 2, Ayah 73. And among them are unlettered ones who do not know the scripture and, except in wishful thinking. But they are only assuming, they assume that they understand their scriptures. They assume that they are on the correct path. Surah 7, Ayah 30. A group of you he guided, and a group deserved to be in error. Indeed, they had the devils as allies instead of Allah while they thought that they were guided. They thought that they were on the truth. They thought that they were upon guidance. It's not that they knew they were upon misguidance and that they were rejecting guidance. No, they thought that they were on guidance. Surah 18, Ayah 104. Those whose efforts have been wasted in this life while they thought that they were acquiring good by their deeds. They thought that they were doing good by the works that they were performing. And here you could read several Quranic commentaries on this. For, you could even refer to Imam Al-Tabari's commentary on this where he says that, they were, that, they had, that not all disbelievers knowingly reject Tawheed. And he said that this verse is very clear regarding that. You could also re, uh, refer to Tafsir al-Baydawi, al-Wahidi and others. Surah 21, Ayah 24. Or have they taken for worship gods besides him? Say, bring your proof. This Quran is the reminder for those with me and the reminder for those before me. But most of them know not the truth. They do not know the truth. So once again, to say that the kafir is only he who knows the truth and then buries it and then rejects it, is not a correct statement. It's based on a partial reading of the Qur'an. It's not taking into account all of these verses into the Qur'an, of the Qur'an. Surah 38, Ayah 27. And we did not create the heaven and the earth and that between them aimlessly. That is the assumption of those who disbelieve. Surah 41, Ayah 23. 
and that was your assumption which you assumed about your Lord it has brought you to ruin so what you assumed was right about God actually ended up bringing you to ruin and you have become among the losers on the day Allah will resurrect them all this is Surah 58 Ayah 18 on the day Allah will resurrect them all and they will swear to him as they swear to you and think that they are standing on something and they think that they have a case for themselves because they thought that they were right unquestionably it is they who are the liars now we just read eight Quranic passages together that spoke about kuffar who thought that they were doing good who knew not the truth who assumed that they were right so the definition, the kafir is only he who knows the truth and rejects it, falls flat in the clear reading of these passages. Once again, I'm trying my very best to just read out the verses for you and not to inject my interpretation into it. And once again, you could also refer back to the well-known tafasir that you hold in high esteem and see the tafasir on these passages as well. So... I want to make a clarification here. These passages, when read in their context, Dr. Sultan al-Umayri, Dr. Sultan al-Umayri is a specialist in aqidah, in theology, and he's based in Umm al-Qura University in Mecca. And in his book, Ishkaliyat al-I'adhar bil jahl fil bahth al-Aqadi, all right, uh, if anyone could read Arabic, you could refer to that book, and he argues in that book that these passages, their context, is that these people who are being spoken about here, these kuffar, are those who received the message of Islam. They received the message of Islam in its true, correct form and still rejected it, while still thinking that they are right. So these passages have nothing to do with Ahl al-Fatra, those who did not receive the message of Islam. No, these passages are speaking about people who received the true message in its true pristine form with no taint in its representation and still rejected it while thinking that they are still on the truth. But then the question comes, but isn't it problematic? Isn't it problematic that Allah would punish someone for his ignorance? Shouldn't Allah only hold people accountable for that which they know? So let's say I do go up to a Christian and I tell him, I give him the message of Islam, clearly not tainted, but he says, well, you know what? I'm, I still think that the evidence for my faith is still stronger than yours. I still think that I understand what you're saying. I understand the message of Islam as you've given it to me but I still want to follow Christianity. Is that problematic? Is there a rational problem here? Does it seem unfair? Well, inshallah, we will tackle this in the last segment of the discussion when we address rational objections to Salafic exclusivism. So I know what some may be thinking, well, I mean, this doesn't sound fair. Because we shouldn't Allah only punish people for what they know and not for their ignorance, but we will address this in more detail in the last segment. I think we, I will tackle this section and then we will take a break, inshallah. Or would you guys like a break right now? Should we? You want to take a break? Yeah. All right. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We'll take a break in uh, 10 minutes. In 10 minutes? Can you go for the floor or no? Let me finish this section and then we'll take a break. Okay. Because right. the hood is at 1.30, 1.30 p.m. So sure. we'll, we'll, we'll pray at the end, inshallah. Sure. What's the fate of kuffar? Can you comment about the eternal fate of specific individuals? Can I, let's say I know that a good brother, a good Muslim brother passed away. Can I say he's in Jannah? Or someone who apparently died on Kufr, can I say that he's in the hellfire? Now, there's a dispute amongst scholars on this issue. And we want to look at the two opinions that are out there. The first opinion says, no, you cannot say what the eternal fate of a specific individual is. 
unless revelation specifies so. So we know that Abu Lahab and his wife are in hell. We know that Pharaoh is in hell because we have revelation that clearly states that. But when it comes to other people that we don't have revelation in regards, we can't say that. Now, this is not a modernist or a liberal opinion. Actually, this, this opinion actually seems to be the most popular opinion amongst Salaf Salafi scholars. So, for example, Ibn Baz, Abdul Rahman al-Barraq, Sheikh Salah al-Fawzan, Abdul Aziz al raji these are all, uh, all Salafi scholars who are not known for liberalism, and they all adopt this opinion. And the proofs that they give is that proof number one, you can't know with 100% certainty upon which state the person died. You just don't know. If, if that, if it may appear outwardly that this person is a Kafir, but you don't know with 100% certainty that he didn't take the Shahada before he passed away. You don't know that. You don't know with 100% certainty if that Muslim was actually, you know, a spy or whatever, or a munafiq. Proof number two, you can't know whether that person was a munafiq or from Ahlul Fatra. Once again, you don't know especially if you adopt one of the opinions on Ahlul Fatra that we're going to be looking at together after the break. Uh, if you believe that Ahlul Fatra are saved and you don't know that this person that belongs to Ahlul Fatra, then how can you say with a certainty that he's in hell? But I also want to mention something that those scholars who take this opinion that you cannot comment about the fate of a specific person they will say that sometimes there could be exceptions. Let's say, for example, you have a very pious Muslim. He was known in the Islamic community for being pious. And then he passed away. And tens of thousands of people come and attend his funeral prayer. And they speak and praise and speak very highly of him. Many scholars who even belong to this camp will say, this could be a qarina or this could be an indication or a sign that this person's eternal fate is alhamdulillah very good. But to go beyond that, no. The general rule is we do not comment about anyone's fate. So your non-Muslim peers at work, your fellow non-Muslim students at university, your non-Muslim professor at university, it is not your job, it is not your concern to start thinking, oh no, is this person really gonna go to hell and burn in hell? No, your only concern is to present Islam to, the, to those people, or to be the best Muslim you could possibly be uh, to those people. You don't have to go and think about, oh no, this guy, he's such a nice guy at work, he's always so good to me, I can't imagine that he's going to hell. Slow down, who told you he's going to hell? Do you have a revelation that says so? So if you adopt this opinion, that's the way you should be thinking about this issue. Second opinion is, yes you can. Yes, you can judge by the apparent and say that if this person died a kafir, I would also say that he is in hell. If this person died outwardly as a Muslim, I would also say that he's going to heaven. Well, the first proof they give is the generality of the passages that the kafir is in the hellfire and judging by the apparent. They'll say our job in this life is to just judge by the apparent. He outwardly died a kafir. The Quran says that the kafir goes to hell. He's in hell, and so on. The second proof they give is the hadith. If you pass by the grave of a mushrik, give him the glad tidings of hell. Now this seems to be a very strong proof, because here the Prophet ﷺ is saying, excuse me, the Prophet ﷺ here is saying, if you pass by the, the grave of a mushrik, give him the glad tidings of hell. But wait a minute, I don't have revelation telling me that this mushrik is in hell. Well, it appears to bolster the position of this camp which says, see, you have to judge outwardly and just say that every mushrik or kafir is going to hell. But, pe but people from the first camp, the first opinion, will argue that this hadith is not authentic. So there is a dispute over the authenticity of this hadith. Some argue that it's authentic, others argue that it's not authentic, so it's an area of dispute. Thirdly, the statement of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, 
when he spoke about the followers of Tulayh al-Asadi, he said, your dead fighters are in hell. Tulayh al-Asadi was someone who claimed to be a false prophet. And he led in a rebellion or an insurgency against the caliphate, against Abu Bakr when he was a caliph. Eventually, Tulayha repented. When him and his followers repented and they came to Abu Bakr, obviously fighting already occurred and he already lost dead fighters. So Abu Bakr told him, your dead fighters are in hell. So here are people from this camp will argue, opinion number two, they'll argue that Abu Bakr said that his followers are in hell. And Abu Bakr did not, anhu, did not receive revelation saying whether they are in hell or not. So this shows that you're supposed to judge by the apparent and say that all kuffar are going to hell. But then people from the first camp will come and argue. Well, no, what Abu Bakr anhu, was actually saying, was actually emphasizing on is that he was doing takfir no' not takfir mu'ayyan, meaning he was just giving a general ruling of takfir on the group as a whole, not commenting on every individual person, and that he was emphasizing on the fact that, the, that their actions were, peop, were actions of the people who belonged in the hellfire. These are two opinions, both respected opinions. No, there's no harsh opinion, there's no liberal opinion. Okay, good timing. Uh, there's no harsh opinion and there's no liberal opinion here. You're free to choose based on what you think to be the strongest position what opinion you want to adopt. Obviously, if you adopt opinion number one, it will, it will enable you to grapple with this subject much more easily, but that should not be your main motivating factor to adopting opinion number one. You have to make sure that you follow the evidence where it leads. And inshallah, after the break, we will then speak about the punishment of hell and whether it's everlasting or temporary.